Funny, thought I saw a ghost. <coughs> I'm beginning to notice a pattern here. be one of those days, isn't it? Well, here's another horror movie for me to review, but this time I'm going solo. And right from the bat, this cover art really isn't impressive at all. It's just a simple evil cover poster, really. But I'm sure the internet can give me a more info about the... Well, this bodes well, I suppose. I mean, wow! $205 on its box office release? That's a pretty bad sign. Which is weird because it's directed by Jeffrey Hunt, a very decent director. And I've also been told that this movie has a surprising twist at the end. Oh well, let's just pop it in and see why it didn't do so well. Also, f Sinister Pixel for buying this movie for me. Former New York socialite Judith Case and John Raymond are joined by Satan in unholy wedlock before a live altar, a nude redhead. Oh, sorry guys, I appear to have put in the wrong movie. Self-ordained sorcerer minister Anton Levy presided at the San Francisco ceremony. As the worst man looks on, the blessings of Lucifer and Beelzebub are invoked. The elaborate rites smack to publicity because next day the bride and groom secured a conventional wedding license. What the hell am I watching right now? Um... What's going on? This kind of needs more context than this! Wait a second. Is this near the end? <sighs> Great. Another movie you like spoiling itself. So after a rather plain opening title card and some nice few shots of LA, we finally meet our main characters. Two days. Cannot believe I agreed to this shit. Chloe, you wanna head off this J? No, I'm good, thanks. Hey, will you open a fucking window? I hate them already. So we're introduced to Chloe, played by Sarah Highland, David, played by Steven Kruger, Seth, played by Justin Chong, and Elise, played by Clara Marment. And this is the acting we're going to be seeing. Oh my god, that was so camp. <laughs> Knights in Satan's service. Kiss was your pussy, not safe. Hey, don't we all? I hate that word. What? I said it, not me. Hit him anyway, Claude, I love it. riveting. They are also as stereotypical as you can get. With both Seth and Elise filling in the goth emo kids role, David being the tall, tough guy who's dating Chloe, who is the main female lead. They're on their way to Coachella, which is a music and arts festival by the looks of it, but decided to stop by to visit some old Satanic Panic era sites in LA, because that's how you spend your spring break holiday. They get lost because David forgot to turn on his GPS. Wait, are you sure you had the GPS on? I don't know, do I? Nope, because I'm an idiot. Couldn't have put it better myself. Ah, uh, there she is. Welcome back, Kim. I'm sorry, you call her Kim. <sighs> Don't ask. Now you're just plain creepy. 
Before they head off to the hotel, they notice a stranger in the building seemingly trying to get their attention, but they're just going to ignore this and drive off. Oh, by the way, remember that scene. It's very important. So after getting to the hotel and meeting James, the hotel clerk, our main characters head into the room Elise requested them to stay in, only to find out that it was once belonged to Lenny Gore, who killed herself in that very room. One question though. Who the hell is Lenny Gore? Room 204. Lenny Gore slit her throat here. What? Yup. 1972, one of the early sisters of LaVey's Church of Satan. Check out the bloodstains like wet paint. Huh. Okay. Also, when I googled her name, I found a lot of results leading back to this movie. So, yeah. That was a little fun. Early the next morning, Chloe stumbles into a pointless jump scare. Oh, get used to those jump scares, guys, because there's a lot of them. We also see another pointless scene of Elise and Seth trying to contact Lenny Gore through the Ouija board, which is always a good idea to do, right? <laughs> oh, wait. B. J. BJ. Oh my god, it's like we're thinking the same thing. <laughs> Prick. Well, that happened. It's not cool. Nobody's taking this seriously. Okay, sorry, your bullshit satanic tourism, I have to take this seriously? It's not satanic tourism, it's about understanding the dark natures. Wow, that's very Aleister Crowley of you. I swear to God, I can't deal with this frat boy shit. Hey, 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 hey. Tension release. We'll have our coffee, and from now on, they'll behave. Look, we're on board. Our minds are open. Yep, that's the face of somebody taking this seriously. So they go to Anton Levy's Church of Satan to take a picture, only for two Satanists to come out and give them a very warm welcome. Uh, dude, uh, we're trying to find the Sharon Tate house. Twice. Hey, did we ever find out where her house is? What's up, cock, bitch? Also, fun fact, the actor playing the Satanist is Jason from that very serious Power Ranger movie. Oh, how the mighty have morphin. <laughs> After some more scenes of the kids going to other satanic locations with another pointless jump scare, they head to a Satanist store called the Black Door Shop. It is at this point that I would talk about the characters a little bit more, especially why David doesn't want to do this touring and wants to do some real touring of LA, but... The dialogue is just so dumb at times. And I don't even believe that they're proper friends too. I mean, Chloe and Elise are cousins and Seth and David are just the boyfriends, but at times they get along and then others, it feels like they really don't like each other. So it's a bit confusing. While in the store, they look around and when asked about a book Elise wants to buy, the shop owner simply replies by being a dick. What about this? You know Compton Greek? I can read. Do you need the accent for the incantations? Wouldn't work for you. Well, that was bad customer service. But the kids eventually get kicked out after Seth peeks through a curtain to see a little ritual is taking place. Also, another fun fact, the actor playing the shop owner is the Mist from The Flash and Victor Zaz from Gotham. So that's kind of cool. Are you gonna spill some pig's blood on me? No, just cut your fucking heart out. Hey. After getting kicked out, they eventually tour LA properly. And it is at this point that you realize that you're 17 minutes into the film and nothing has happened. I don't mind the characters enjoying themselves in this movie because, well, you know, it's LA and showing us some little character development. What little character development there is anyway. But this movie just drags on. Later on, the group talk more about the shop owner from earlier and decide to spy on him due to his suspicious activities. Because why not? That night, they're all parked outside the shop and after a very lovely and pointless scene of a homeless guy vomiting, they see the shop owner and proceed to follow him. So after 20 whole minutes, something bloody happens. I mean, sure, it's just them tailing a the guy, but it's better than just, well, anything. So after following the shop owner for a little while, some creepy music starts playing and they end up at an old house. Oh, I don't know. The studio lighting that's reflecting off your van might give you away. 
The group sneak round the back and witness what looks to be a ritual, although I'm surprised no one can see them since their faces are in plain sight of a few members. The cult's leader brings a girl into the circle and after filling in the boob spot of the movie, it looks to be the girls about to get cut open. Chloe screams at them to stop, which leads them getting a gun pointed at them and running away. After they escaped, Seth notices that he dropped his phone at the house. This leads to them making assumptions on what they witnessed and do nothing with the info and just go to bed. <sighs> anyway, Elisa's phone gets a call from Seth's phone and it turns out to be the girl from last night whose name is Alice. They meet up and she hands Seth's phone back and they talk about what happened last night. Because whatever fucking virginal sacrifice was back. It had. wasn't a sacrifice. Then what was it? You wouldn't understand. Try me. It was an excommunication. They were kicking you out? Why? Because I wouldn't do what they wanted. Sounds like school. Alice leaves and Chloe points out the obvious that she's alone and homeless. She's just a kid, probably some homeless runaway. Chloe, we all have our issues. Fuck you, Seth. She was cool enough to call and give your fucking phone back. She didn't even want money. Yeah, what she wanted was a place to crash. You could read it all over her face. Oh, so? Would it have been so bad to help her out? Chloe, for all we know, she could have been some little crackhead. She's not wrong, but also they do have a point of taking in a complete stranger without knowing her first. But in the end, decide to let her stay for the night, and from the moment she enters the room, she recognises it as Lenny Gore's room, which surprises everyone else, and things get a little weird from here. She tried to make a star with the blood. Why? She needed a door. She wanted to be welcomed. Into hell? Didn't know it was so hard to get in. Hell isn't a place. It's a beautiful confusion. I believe in the power and reward granted unto him. Power not of this earth. <clears throat> I didn't mean to bring down the party. Don't worry, the movie's doing that job just fine. Later that night, everyone is enjoying some music, drinks, some pointless kissing and bad dancing until Alice starts losing her shit and stating that she can feel Lenny in the room and says they can reach her too by chanting and doing some kind of ritual. This bodes well. She then draws a symbol which has some kind of countdown to five and if you can put two and two together, you know where this is going. Alice then proceeds to vomit, kiss Chloe and piss herself? What the f She then says they will be summoned and she'll be seeing them soon and proceeds to kill herself. Oh. Hopefully now after that something will happen now. So after being questioned by the police of the slow motion department, they're told to stay in LA for two more days, so they head off to David's cousin's place to stay. And to be honest, the acting in this scene shows some real strong potential with how each one of them is affected by what happened. Just a shame about the dialogue. But it continues into the night with Chloe having a nightmare and the next morning with how silent everyone is. I also don't mind the scene with Chloe and David arguing either as this feels like a proper reaction to the traumatic experiences they both had. Oh, that's you. Hey, that was a pretty fair analysis of your movie. Oh, you meant that? Really? Yeah, that is a cute little symbolic symbol you got there. Oh, finally, something's happening. Man, better fire that house cleaner, cause... Eww, nasty. So the group begin to notice that a lot of strange things are happening around them, from stuff being smashed, things on the ceiling, and badly rendered CGI crows drown into their deaths. All off screen, by the way. They decide to go to the shop owner for answers because they believe it is them that's causing all of this, but after cornering the owner, he tells them that it wasn't them, and also explains why they really kicked Alice out of the cult. About, you man. got rid of her because she wouldn't go along with your twisted shit. We wouldn't go along with hers, man. 
We kicked her out because she was too hardcore. Even for us. Too hardcore for a cult who worships the devil. <laughs> now I have heard everything. After another instant, they all agreed to just leave town and get out of LA. After loading everything up and almost leaving, they had to pull over due to Elise feeling sick. Stopping outside the same building, they saw the stranger from earlier in the movie. Before Elise goes to the toilet, Chloe notices some strange markings bearing the number 2 on her. So... yeah... She's gonna die. After hearing her scream, they open up the door to find... Only her clothes and a few marks. But nothing left of Elise. They killed her off screen? Well, that sucks. I hope they don't make a habit of this. We're never going to see their deaths, aren't we? They hear Elise's voice coming from the building and Seth goes in after her. Chloe tries to call the police, but something is interfering with the signal, so both Chloe and David go after Seth. Okay, how and why is he able to call them when the signal isn't working? And why does he sound like he's on a radio? They both climb up the building only to start hearing Seth screaming in pain from being on fire. They go up another flight of stairs to find only his burnt clothes and phone. What the hell? Why is everyone dying off screen? I mean, I get what they're trying to do, but why? A death scene in a horror movie is kind of important, you know. After seeing the number 3 is on the wall, Chloe notices that David has the number 4 scratched onto his face, meaning that he's next. They both try to run, but David is also taken, leaving only his religious necklace behind, meaning that he's also dead. We then get the beginning part of the movie, which leads into a least ghost jump scare. So much like this movie, it's trying to hang in there. <laughs> Looking out of her window, Chloe sees a van driving down to the building. She tries to call for help, but uh, uh, Wait, is that them? From the past? Oh my god, it really is them. I mean, th th how is this possible? Wait, is this the big twist? Time travel! No shit, Sherlock! Huh? I mean, you could argue that the devil is taunting her, but that raises even more questions! How is he able to do this? How is he do- oh my god, I'm looking way into this, aren't I? Ow, this hurts my head. Ow! Oh, screw this, it's almost over. After another jump scare, Chloe tries to escape, but the door is slammed shut, and something begins to bang on it. So Chloe is dead now, and hell is a small confined space with marks around. You could argue that this could mean that Chloe is claustrophobic and this is her own personal hell, meaning that everyone who has died is in their hell too. But that would mean some thought went into this, and I'm guessing they didn't have a good budget for this. Chloe is taunted more by voices, visions, until the lights go out. To see her mouth is stitched shut and her arms have been cut off. Again. Off. Screen. So, that was satanic. How does it fare? And stay out! Mm, so yeah, that wasn't a good movie.
The acting isn't great, save for a few moments, the movie drags on for nearly 20 minutes, the scare factor is non-existent, and we only get one death scene. And that twist. It's a real shame too, because it has potential to be a very good movie, but it fails so bad. So bad. If you excuse me guys, I need to go and clear my thoughts. <clears throat> Oh. <sighs>